Hey everyone, uh, I guess we're going to try to see if we can get some of these video series going. And the first one we're going to do here is uh, how to create a G object. And for those of you that don't know, a G object is how we do object oriented programming in C, specifically on the GNOME environment. G object came out of GIMP years ago. Many of you are familiar with the GIMP toolkit, um, GTK. But uh, for those of you that don't, GTK and G object came out of the GIMP program and were split off into their own libraries uh, in the late 1990s. And we've been maintaining them ever since, and they are a core part of the GNOME Foundation. And so if you would like to be contributing to our platform, our free software platform we're creating, it would be good to learn how to use these tools. So the goals of this video are going to be uh, pretty humble. We're going to start with just creating our first G object. It's going to be a really simple object. It's going to be a person object with like a name and such. And we're going to add a property to the object and we're going to add a signal to the object. So we learn how to do uh, the main things you would do with a G object, which is like methods, properties, and signals. All right. So the first thing we're going to do here is create a new project. We're using Builder, which is an IDE I'm building for GNOME. I already created a directory here for it, so let's just point it at that. All right, so now we have a new project set up. So the first thing we need to do when creating a G object is create our source and header files. Hopefully you're familiar with C a little bit to know that we typically split up uh, our, our code into both a header and the source file. The header includes the different things that are meant to be used outside of the C file and what we don't put into the header um, descriptions of what we're putting in the C file are meant to be what we'd call private. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is create a new header file. We're gonna call it example person.h and then we're gonna create another new empty file which is example person.c. So just out of practice, let's uh, take a look at the snippets here quick in, in Builder. We can go ahead and add a GPL header to the top. I use GPL. Sometimes I use LGPL. Uh, do whatever you like. So first thing I'm going to do here is add our, our guards to the, to the header file. What guards do is they allow us to include a file multiple times, but not redefine everything. Uh, you know, if you defined a person twice, uh, the system would have an, an error with that. So it helps us make it easier to write the code and, and protect ourselves from compiler errors. So the first thing we need to do is we need glib object.h. That's what defines the G object. And we're going to start by doing a G declare final type. And it's an example person example person and see we kind of duplicate ourselves here a bunch um, so let me go over this quick the the first parameter here to this macro and keep in mind that this uh, g declare final type is a macro this g begin decals up here expands out to x turn c but only if you're in a c plus plus compiler and then the same down here this n decals will expand out to end of the extern decals if you're in a C++ compiler, uh, which we're not. Um, okay, so now that we have the G declare final type here with example person, uh, the first parameter here is the name of the structure we're gonna have. And then this is the function prefix for our G object. So functions that manipulate G objects will start with example person and then its namespace is example, and the object name is person, and it inherits from G object. Keep in mind that these, this macro, the G declare final type, was available, I believe, in glib 2.40 and newer. It might be 2.42 and newer, but I think it's 2.40. And we need to do one more thing. We need to define example type person to example person get type. All right, so this is all it takes to define our, our G object in the header file. Remember that you should use derivable 
if you need a subclass, so instead of final here, we would use drivable type. Uh, we'll get to a little bit more of that later, but for now we're just going to use final. And final means that the, the object cannot be subclassed further. All right, so now let's go create our C file. Again, we'll just put a little GPL header at the top. And we will start with include sample person dot h and then we have a couple functions we need. Well first we'll do a g define type. This is kind of the C equivalent to our G declare final type in the header. And so again it gives it example person and then example person is a function prefix and then g type object because that is the object we're inheriting from. And if you'd like to see here what that macro expands to, this is all available in dev help or in the, uh, the dev help search here in builder. Okay, now that we've done our gdefine type, we need to do a couple other things. Uh, the gdeclare type or gdeclare final type here uh, will not define the structure we need for our object instance. So we need to add that over here. We'll go over this in just a second. So you might be familiar with how we inherit from objects in other languages, uh, where you might just do class foo inherits bar. Uh, in this case, the way inheritance works in, in G object and in C in general, uh, we just shove the parent object type, or in this case, struct type, as the first field of our structure. Therefore, all of the objects that inherit from it, the beginning of their object is just as if it was the, the parent object. Uh, so we need to define ours here, and this is what it looks like. Now, the reason it is struct example person instead of something like type def struct example person is because that's what the, the G declare final type did for us. It actually did G define type struct example person to like that. So we just need to define what struct example person means. So we can get rid of that and just fill this in here. The next step is we need to add two functions that are required of all G objects. They need a class init function and they need an instance init function. And the, the class init is like your, um, uh, almost like a static constructor. It's, it's the class constructor. So it'll only ever be called once for the class. Unlike a static constructor, it's not guaranteed to be run at the beginning of your process. It'll just, it'll get run the first time an instance of the object is created or someone looked introspected on that type. So we'll do static void class init. We need another function that is static void init. And for those that aren't familiar what static means in, in C, well, it's kind of an overloaded keyword, but the in this case, what it means is that the function is not available outside of the file we're working on right now. So it won't get a symbol created in the generated library or anything like that. Okay, so this is enough to create a G object. This is, this is an object that won't actually do anything, but if we open up a terminal here, we should be able to do GCC. I'll just make this bigger here for you. We're using the G object library and example person dot C. So it would have compiled, but we're missing a main function. So since it's not a program, we could compile it as a shared library. And that would work. Now we see that we have this libtest.so here. And we see a couple functions here. 
these were all created by the G object for us in those macros. So this empty object isn't really all that useful on its own. Objects are these collections of methods and properties and signals in G object. Uh, so let's go ahead and make this person a little bit more useful by giving them a name. So first we're gonna go ahead and create the accessor functions for this. We want a function to be able to get the name and to set the name. So we'll do a cons gchar get name. And keep in mind that I'm using gchar here. You could just as easily use char. That's totally fine. I just have a habit of using gchar because you know we have for a very long time. And you really don't want to know the reason why we had it to begin with. But um, yeah, you know, history. So we have two functions here. One of them will return the person's name and we'll notice that the return value is const because we're gonna return a pointer to the person's name and it will not be modified by the caller. And then a function to set the name. So over here in the C file, let's go ahead and add a field for name. I like to keep things aligned. And if you wanted to set a default value for that, you might do it here. You might do self name equals g stir dupe, you know, dummy. Uh, and then we need to implement these two functions. So we would do return self name. And then to set the name, we would need to do if, we wanna to check to see first if the name is the same as what it already is. And if it, if it is the same, like we don't wanna do anything with it. We don't wanna like reallocate another string for it or whatever. So if it's not equal, to that. And remember that stir comp returns zero if they're equal, and negative one if one string's smaller, one if the string's bigger, or sorts greater. So we'll free. And then set it to the new string. So let's go back over. I'm going to try compiling it again. It still works. If we look at the symbols, we'll see that we have a get name function. And we have a set name function. You'll end up creating lots of methods like this over your time. It's a pretty typical pattern. But what we can do is we can create something called a property. Properties are kind of like public fields, fields that you would allow other objects to manipulate, except for they're, they're not available publicly. They have to go through an arbiter function to actually set the field. What's nice about this is it allows us to have something like a field, but uh, be able to maintain an ABI long-term if we need to change the implementation of how it's get or set. If you have people getting and setting the fields, public fields directly, if you end up changing how the implementation works, you may lock yourself into a corner. But there's also a bunch of other fantastic features with properties, uh, like we can bind them between two different objects uh, you can access them from the GTK inspector if you're writing a GUI application, and uh, you can watch them for changes. So let's go ahead and create a property. First, all properties need a unique identifier for the class, and you cannot use zero. So we make a dummy, a num value called prop zero, and then this is prop name, and then last prop, which tells us the number of properties we had. So we can do, we have a little helper here in Builder. So we're going to have a new prop called name. It's a string type and it has a name. This, this is the, the name that's used internally. This is the nickname for it. And then this is the description, name of the person. The second and third strings there aren't super important. They were more important years ago. And then the default value for it is null. 
We'll go ahead and actually make that the case just by deleting this. Remember that your structures are completely zeroed out when you start. So this is by default null. We want the param to be readable and writable and this static strings thing is a, a warp. And it's a warp because I kind of wish they were always static. Uh, but what it tells it tells GObject is that you, you do not need to duplicate the string. It'll always be available. And since it's an in, it's a literal string, that's the case. So we're going to use the install properties. We need to go make this properties. This uh, saving the properties around the gparam specs is what describes a property. Saving them around is an, an uh, optimization that isn't necessarily needed, but in many cases it's good good hygiene just to do it. So this creates a new param, new parameter, new property that is called name. It's a type of a string, and it is both readable and writable. That said, we haven't set up the code to actually read and write the string, so we need to do that. So we have gObject class, gObject. So what this does here is gObject class. So for every instance, every object we have, so in this case, example person, we also have an example person class. And that is where we put all the virtual functions. And we'll get more onto this in a future, a future video, but uh, know that the, the class contains uh, things that are shared between all instances of the object rather than just a single instance. So in this case, the object class has a virtual function that is called getProperty. And we'll make our own function called example person get property. And then they have one that's called set property. And we will create one called set property. So what we're doing is we're gonna override those functions and then provide our own getter and setter for them. Because this started from a G object, it's a G object class we're overriding. The first parameter of it is G object, not event, or sorry, not example person. And then there we go. Switch. And this prop ID here is going to map to our name that we gave the properties up here. So if we want to set the name one, we just do case prop name, and we do g value set string get name. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna cast the object to the example person because that's that's our subclass, and then we are going to go ahead when the prop name has been requested, we're gonna set the string in this value that says that. Now what a G value is, is a generic boxing type. And like what a boxing type is, is it allows you to put lots of different things inside it. Think of it as like a container that, that can hold one thing and that one thing could be an integer, a Boolean, a double precision floating point, a pointer, an object in this case, or a string. It could be tons of different things. Uh, and since properties can be just about any type, they need to be they need to be accessed through a, a boxing container to get access to this. And we're gonna do the same thing for the set property, except for it's slightly different. We still have a prop ID, but the value. is const because it can't be changed. It's there for us to set it. So again, we'll switch on the prop ID. But this time we'll call set name. We'll do g value get string. And 
And so now we have our example person, which we've just cast our object to an example person. And then when we get the property name prop name, we'll set the name based on the string that it gave us. So now we can we can use this as a property and it's hard it's hard to kind of grasp the usefulness of properties until we get further along and you can see this used inside of something but uh, know that properties are very useful and we should be in the habit of using them. It will help clean up your code later as we start doing more complex things. So let's try to compile it again. It seems to have worked. Maybe just add some warnings. No warnings, okay. Again, now we see we have a get property function and a set property. These are little t's here, which means that they're not going to be exported into the final library. Those are just there because we still have debug information available. The big t's are exported as symbols. So now that we've added a property, let's go ahead and add a signal. Signals are a way to react to events going on in your program. And it's really the fundamental uh, basis of event-driven programming. So you'll get a situation where uh, you want to react to a button clicked in a GTK application. As you might imagine, a GTK button has a clicked signal, and what you can do is have a function called back when that event exists, or when, it, when it's occurred. Uh, so in this case, when the user clicks on the clicked button. But you're not limited to the, to the signals that are already created, you can create your own. So let's imagine that our person object here is representing a buddy in a, in a roster, like a chat client. And one of the things uh, we might wanna be able to react to is the other, uh, the other person notifying us that uh, they wanna communicate. So let's add an event, or in this case, in G object, we call them signals. We'll add a signal called uh, yo. We'll do the last signal thing again as well, just so that we get the, the list of them. And signals have a unsigned integer identifier. And then we need to register the signal in the object creation. So we'll do signals yo equals g signal new. And the signal is called yo. Now, the second parameter to g signal new, here, let me just close this first and we can, is the type. And this is always going to be the type that we're in. So for us, this is, we can do g type from class. We could also do example type person. That would be acceptable. But I, tend to just always use g-type from class uh, because if I ever rename the class or do anything else um, interesting with it, 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 just, it just works. So the next parameter is whether or not we want to run our class handler first or last. A class handler will be called uh, when your signal is emitted and sometimes you might want to structure your code in such a way that it is uh, after all the other items have been notified, you may want to do something yourself as like a final step. In this case, we're not really going to use a default handler, so we can just say we're going to run last. We could just as easily say run first. And then uh, we don't have a callback to call, so we'll just pass zero for that. Otherwise, we would do something like this. We would do like g struct offset in the example person class, and we'd want to call the yo, uh, just so that you get an idea of how to do this. But we're not going to do that. So we'll just comment that out there for you. And then the next parameter in it is an accumulator. Now these are this is a more advanced topic. Accumulators are used in situations, uh, like if you use GTK, uh, you'll find it used in situations where you can return true to prevent further signal handlers from running. We're not gonna get into that now, but know that that's what the accumulators are used for. So we have an accumulator and then the data for the accumulator. So the next two parameters are gonna be null. 
and then after that it takes a C marshaller. We can just pass null for this. Years ago this used to matter, but we have a really good implementation now that's very generic. So no matter what you, you use, uh, it will handle it. So we can pass null for that. And for those of you that don't know what a marshaller is, uh, it allows you to transform parameters between language domains. So we may have a situation where this is this code's being extended in or used from Python, and we need to be able to marshal the Python parameters into uh, parameters that can be sent to the C function. And this has to be done dynamically rather than with a, a compiler. And so we, we need to learn, uh, teach it how to take a string and make sure that that string is available across the function call into C. We don't need to cover that too much in detail now. Uh, we can do a more in-depth thing covering that. And we need now the return type to the function, to the signal. And this isn't going to take any return type. It's just going to be void. So we'll use gtype none for that. And then it won't have any params other than the instance param, which is always provided. So we'll do zero params as well. gtype none and zero parameters. And so now we have to find our signal. Now the signal isn't very useful yet because nothing is, is emitting it. So let's add a function here quickly to emit the signal. I'll call it emit yo. So now if you were writing a, a chat program that needed to notify from something you, you, you read from the network that this person wants to talk, you might call this emit yo function and it will uh, signal everybody that's requested to know about a yo signal from this person instance. So we will just do g signal emit use self. We're going to use the yo signal and it has no detail. And we can get into details in a, in a follow up, but know that uh, the signal, signals can have details which are additional information attached to the signal name. And then we want to add this to our header here. Make things line up. And so now we can call that as well. So let's go try to compile it again. Things compile. We look at the symbols. We should see emit yo. And the symbol's public. So this is all nice, but allowing external objects to call the emit yo may not be something we quite want. So let's take a look at adding a private header that allows to emit yo, but only for things inside of our program. So you'll see this is really commonly done uh, when you're doing object-oriented programming in C. So we'll do like an example person private.h. So this is gonna include things that we don't necessarily want to make public. Maybe they'll change, maybe they're not ready for everyone else to use, or maybe it's just because we want access to it from another part of our program, but don't really want to maintain public API for it yet. We're going to include uh, example person.h because everything in here will require that first. And the first thing we're going to do is add our emit yo function. And then we can also just go ahead and move our example person over as well. And let's just go ahead and add our GPL header to the top here. Note that, you know, just because you guys are copying my code here, like you don't need a GPL header. You, you can use it however you like. I just want you to be in the habit of putting them there.
And then our C file, we also need to include the private. In fact, we can include just the private because it includes the regular header for us. Now we can GCC it again. Should look just like it did before. So in summary here, remember to structure your code with G objects. You know, think about things as objects just like you would in any other language. It really helps you structure your code uh, in a way that's easy for other people to come in and uh, quickly ramp up on how things uh, interact with each other and what belongs together. And do use properties. Uh, they're really useful when you need to inspect things later on when you're writing like a GUI application or if you need to bind properties together in a system. And use signals when uh, events occur that you need to perhaps handle from some other code. If you find yourself setting callback functions all over the place, this is a perfect area to use a signal instead. And I think the next one of these things we'll do is uh, G-object interfaces. And interfaces are, you know, as you would expect interfaces in other languages, you can do interfaces in C as well. And G-object supports them quite well. So I'm looking forward to putting that together for you, and I will see you next time.